really cool to have Young and Bill here spending time with us. Uh, so I'm going to kick off with a couple of leading questions and then think about what you're going to ask Young and Bill and then raise your hand. We're, I'm going to do probably first 10 or 15 minutes to kick this off. And then I'm going to turn it over to you because this is your time with Young and Bill. So um, stop screen share. Hey, Young, do you want to say hi first? Sure. Good morning, everybody. Uh, happy to see everybody from all over the world. And uh, I'm, I guess I'm in California right now, summer in the morning. Did my run this morning and happy to uh, join you guys in a nice sunny day. Awesome. Hey, Bill. Hey, Victoria. Hey, welcome everybody from around the world. It, I, I'm just so delighted to see this community grow and grow and everybody being in a position to help each other and to help the world. So uh, keep it all, keep it going. Awesome, thank you, Bill. Um, so Bill, let's start with you. Tell us how a little bit about how Extreme Tech Challenge got started. And then Young, I'm gonna go to you to talk about the pivot in 2019, this new amazing direction that we're going. Uh, so Bill, yes. first. Yeah, it uh, surprisingly started on a kiteboarding trip to Western Australia, where uh, uh, I think probably 12 years ago, I was invited to come speak at a, uh, a gathering of uh, university research projects at the major universities in Australia that had gathered at Curtin University to uh, talk about how to take their little research projects and turn them into commercial entities. And uh, on that trip, um, I was asked also to meet a uh, young gal who uh, uh, later entered the first uh, uh, little competition before it was called XTC. Um, I, I was so excited by the crowd of young people working on cool stuff um, at a time when uh, it was just becoming possible for one or two people to start something in their dorm rooms like Mark Zuckerberg did at Harvard for Facebook. And uh, I looked at that crowd and I thought, somebody in this room is going to go back to their dorm room and coach something up. I should find out who that is. And I announced that I was going to bring back a bunch of my tech friends from Silicon Valley that kiteboarded to throw a contest on my next kiteboarding trip and that the winner would get a year of free hosting. Yeah, and, uh, uh, and Melanie Perkins <laughs> ended up uh, joining the, uh, the, the gathering and that ultimately became Canva, which I think you guys know is uh, you know, probably y'all use it for your design stuff, but the company's uh, been profitable for five years. It's worth about $40 billion. And um, she was able to basically piece together her team and funding from uh, basically a group of kiteboarders uh, that um, believed in her, in what she wanted to do. That first contest was called the Western Australia App Awards for mobile apps, the so WAP Awards. It became the Oz Apps for all of Australia. It became a regional competition and ultimately we ported it over to include Sir Richard Branson as a guest judge uh, and hold the finals on Necker Island. And then, uh, and Young, by the way, was the uh, sponsor and funder of um, uh, the very first competitions we ever held and was always a guiding light on how to try to build the organization to make it scalable. And ultimately we pivoted it, um, spun it out of uh, our kiteboarding group, which is called Acta Global, into its own 501c3 under Young's leadership. And bam, it's now become like 50 times the size of anything that it ever was. And I think draws a lot more resources and great community that I think can take any of your projects with you as the lead and help you find network and funding and corporate partners and things that might give you that shot to you know, take it up into the right. So um, thank you, Young, and thank you, Victoria, for making it all possible. Yeah, thank you, Bill. It's quite a bit of history. And, and Young, take us, take us through 2019 now. Well, actually, I'll go back because I think the uh, bit is right. Uh, so Bill and I have been kiting together, I don't know, in Maui and other places from 2005. So we, had, we need to have some good business regions to get together. <laughs> and, and this is how I think we kind of began looking at purpose along with our hobby. And along the way, I think that uh, we moved into extreme technology for athletes that can be able to share the common passion and then come around about five years ago, I think that group moved into doing something even bigger 
and making it into a global sustainability driven purpose. And uh, uh, I have to give a lot of credit to uh, President Macron helping me to go that direction because I was his advisor at the time. And we had a Tech for Good summit, summit. And at that point, we decided let's make it something even bigger than what it is today and mobilize corporations. There's your 50 CEOs there of largest corporations you can imagine, along with the startups so that we can create a highway from the uh, great innovative idea to realization, which requires a accelerated path. So that was really the kind of genesis of our discussions in the past. I am really grateful that uh, we have a team uh, that you have, uh, we have announced earlier that are all volunteers and uh, got in. And then eventually I hired Victoria to help us to join in along with the board of directors that can be able to guide. And that's kind of where we are today. And, you know, I know this is a big competition and a lot of our, our uh, exciting companies that they are. And there is a winner, but all of you are winners. So uh, 110 companies in this course that are being in here, all of you are winners that are joining us today. So I welcome you all. <laughs> Awesome. True. I mean, I, I think it's just being part of the community, right? Being part of the family and what this means and, and what sort of resources um, that, that you know, people can benefit. So um, how should, I, I only have two more questions and then I'll, I'll turn it over to the floor and I see we already have hands up. So how, how should people take maximum benefit from their participation in XTC? You know, we have upcoming uh, pitch coaching, global finals, bootcamp session and so forth. Uh, how do they get the most uh, ROI out of this experience? Bill? You know, it's, it's uh, as I mentioned in the intro, it's really about community. There's a lot of resources around the table, not just from the Extreme Tech Challenge organization and all its partners, but also in, in the group. You know, all of you have been kind of inching along in your businesses, and I really encourage you to the extent you can to kind of listen to what other people are saying, see what kinds of lessons and struggles and victories uh, each other are having and try to try to draw, think, you know, draw help off of each other. Um, in addition to the kinds of things that we have at XTC that the contest itself was really designed to do a couple of things. One is to try to help some of you get greater visibility, you know, so you might get more customers, more attention, more media. Uh, and we do that, you know, through the various uh, uh, kind of press releases and things that we do around uh, the sub competitions and the final competitions. It's also designed to try to help you if you get new customers and are at a point of starting to scale to incrementally do that at, uh, at hopefully lower cost, you know, lower cost of customer acquisition because of the visibility. And in some cases, you know, you might find corporate partners through this, this contest that help you with partnerships and infrastructure that um, uh, allow you to, to scale without putting a lot of money down yourself. And then lastly, um, uh, we've surrounded this organization with a lot of experienced people, not just in venture capital, but in the corporate world that are looking for innovation through partners. And to the extent that you can partner up with them, uh, there's just a lot of, of ways to lower your friction and uh, uh, kind of get, get uh, a little further, a little faster. So that, that's kind of what it's all about. Yeah, that's a great mission. And, and young, not everybody lives in major innovation hubs like Berlin and Silicon Valley and Israel. How can, they, how can these entrepreneurs uh, tap into the resources they need? How do they get their hustle on to move to the next step? Well, first of all, I think innovation has no boundary and no border. So I think great ideas can come from anywhere. Just like the, uh, you know, Canva came from Perth, Australia, and you would not expect that um, given the, maybe you expect the kite surfing or wind surfing out there, but you know, some of these ideas can really come from amazing locations that are building big community. So I think we can all learn. I mean, today you can learn from each other from, from anywhere, uh, mainly because we are all connected. Thanks to Zoom, the company that Bill and I both invested they can enable us all get connected much easier than ever before. And so, you know, use your network. I mean, right here in the co-host, you have all these contact points and I'm sure you can learn from each other from that process. 
we have a corporate sponsors that are actually interested in finding you to help you to scale. So if you see the Microsoft or Intel or Samsung and others that can be able to help you, I think there's ways to also get connected and some of us can help you also from background. Uh, also, I think just looking at successful companies who raised a lot of money, actually, uh, 2020 winners, I believe, raised $150 million. Uh, uh oh, hold on. Uh oh, hang on. Hang on, hang on. Uh, okay, I think I unmute myself. So I'm oh, up. sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I think there's a lot. I'm not sure where I was earlier, but I think there's a lot of successful companies in this area of uh, XTC. I think 2020 winners raised over $150 million worth of venture capital. Dollars. So there's a lot of success that can help us to be more successful. And our goal at XTC was very simple. We want to help to create a accelerated way by showcasing great companies that are making impact and learn from each other so that we can build a network of uh, entrepreneurs that can support each other. We could not do our finals in person because of the pandemic, but starting this June, 14th, I'm hoping that we can all meet in person and be able to actually interact and be able to exchange and, and celebrate. Uh, the celebrating the innovative ideas can make a huge impact. Great. Um, so now let's go to your questions. I see Uche, you've had your hand up for a while. Uh, so please unmute yourself and then your name, company, uh, country, and then ask your question. Can you unmute yourself or? Um, I can't, we can't hear you. Do you want to turn off your camera to see if that's better? Or if you want to type your questions in chat, um, I can help you ask that question. Uh, it's in and out. Do you want to type it in chat? Ooh. Uche, do you want to type it in chat? I, I don't think I got that. Um, I think it's easier if you type it in chat and let me ask it for you. Okay, all right, all right. Oh, wait, wait, I think we got you again. I, I noticed you're on a cell phone. It might be hard for you to type, so go ahead. Okay, thank you. My name is Craig from Nigeria. I'm the managing director of and I'm in yeah, my question is that's the Tina in San Francisco, California, and the final push with respect to star, star acquisition procurement and uh, So I want to know how the team would assist or support from the tech to the US for the dinner final pitch uh, presentation. So I want to know the measure of what you know that the five pitch. So I want to know the what is on ground people us get uh, in the shortest time. So thank you very much for time to the entire team thank you, Victoria. I appreciate you. And then that's my question. Thank you. Okay, I think I got a little bit of it. And if you want to, um, John, reach out, send him an email. Maybe we can get a question. But I think you're talking about what kind of support we can provide to get you to San Francisco for the live event. Is that yes? Not if that's yes. I think I got that. That little um, bit. Yeah, so um, you're all traveling here on your own expense. But if you have any particular need, we can definitely address that offline. So let me take that with you um, offline. We'll schedule a separate conversation for that. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? You can use the raise hand uh, 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 icon or you can just raise your hand, I'll call on you. Oh, William, go ahead and mute yourself and ask your question. Hi, uh, good William morning, John. Good morning, John. First, there's morning. like two Williams. Mm -hmm. 
Hey, I was wondering, um, were there any kind of fintech customer acquisition strategies that had really stood out to you as particularly savvy or ones that you just really liked as kind of guerrilla style or anything that just really stood out as, as unique and innovative? Yeah, uh, I can think of one right away. Uh, I think 2020 winner, uh, I think the, uh, they were the uh, finalists, uh, was a company called Rewire, uh, Rewire from Israel. And Rewire was about providing really banking uh, capacity for migrants who are coming from Indonesia or Syria, Philippines. And when you go into new countries, you don't have any banking capacity. So when you want to set up a bank and be able to transmit money, uh, it, it was an extremely expensive way of doing it, uh, Western Wire and, and Union and others. So being able to get a ability using mobile phone as a way to give you credibility and setting up an account and then being able to uh, support that community was I thought was a pretty good innovative way of supporting the particular group that was needed for that type of things and paying a lot of fees to make that happen. Okay. Great question. Let's go to the second William Wiseman and mute yourself. Oh, that was my question. Thank you, though. Oh, that was your question? Oh, OK. Yeah, yeah, about the uh, customer the second, William. Thank you. <laughs> the second, William. OK, well, let's go to Anastasia. Jack. Great names Great. think alike. My name is William yeah. as well. <laughs> yeah, we've got two Williams. Uh, can I ask my question? Or oh, oh yes, I'm sorry. Um, William, yes, not him, please. Mm -hmm. uh, cool, thanks. I said three questions. Um, uh, one is we move from a startup to a scale up. Um, are there particular methodologies that you found uh, useful? Uh, we've been looking at the Vern Harnish um, book, Scaling Up, as an example. A um, second question is um, uh, I'm a big Samsung fan personally, and so are some of my team. And they asked me to ask, what are Samsung's uh, goals in healthcare? Because you've achieved a lot in so many other different uh, industries. And then the last question is a bit of fun. Uh, I'm in Cape Town and we do a lot of uh, wing foiling. I'm not sure if the, um, the kite surfers would be keen to try that in the future. All right. I'll take uh, the first and last if <laughs> Young doesn't mind. I, I, on scaling, I'd say the, uh, and Young can add to all those, I'm sure. On the scaling thing, to me, it's really all about people that have had experience scaling before. And the, the literature, obviously fantastic to set guidelines but there's no better way than to get experienced help. So it, I think it's really about recruiting and hiring. And wing foiling, I, that's on, Young and I took lessons last uh, two summers ago. Uh, we're not lessons, we took one lesson, but we're uh, on it for this year. Yeah, and uh, your, your place is our target list to uh, go there. I guess water is a bit cold, but I understand. Uh, you know, there is a great book, actually, that I actually was part of in helping on that set up the scale up. Uh, Reed Hoffman, the founder of LinkedIn, wrote a book called Bridge Scale. And that is all about how do you go from, you know, less than two digit numbers to uh, 10,000 people. How do you do that? How do you build a team? What makes sense from the startup may not make sense for scale up. How do you change that? Uh, what are the positions you should think about? So I, I highly recommend take a look at that book. I think Reed is a very thoughtful person and I think that's well written. Uh, second on Samsung Healthcare, uh, I think that uh, Samsung does have a good healthcare programs in Korea. Uh, they have a second largest hospital and they have uh, actually the, um, what I call equipment, medical equipment business. They are also one of the largest maker of antibody-based drugs in the world, uh, which I think most people don't know, but they do it for other people. It's what they call drug boundary business that turned out to be a very big business now uh, from zero to 50 billion in, I think, 10 years. Uh, so that's kind of what's going on. But obviously for you, you're probably using Samsung Health in your mobile phone apps. And, you know, they are trying to improve that. Um, as the time progress, they're adding now the uh, blood pressure measurement and the uh, health rate variability. So combining that along with activities should be able to give you a better insight around uh, body meters and early warning signs. But it's not quite there in my view, but the sensors are improving, algorithm is there, but we probably are still in a journey on that particular one. 
And uh, yeah, I think it'll be fun to visit uh, Cape Town someday to uh, check out the community. And we do have a startup community that are happening over there. So we're very excited to, to have uh, the Africa uh, part of our global community. And I know I think earlier person uh, that was asking question was, I think he's from Nigeria. So it's a great to see the Nigerians and South Africans and others that are being part of this community. Yeah, awesome. And going over to Anastasia for your question. And meet yourself, please. Mm -hmm. Hello, good morning. Um, I have two questions. First question is actually about um, revisiting and make putting more details into a business plan. I'm, I am having trouble just like redoing that process. Um, it's just so tedious. So any pointers on how to really attack the business plan and get as much information out of my head onto paper. Um, and then the second question would be, um, for appeasing to investors um, and future partners, I've hit a wall in my business where it's like everyone's like, oh, everyone says, I love your idea. I really want to um, see this work, but come back to me when uh, like when you're already like started past beta testing. However, the wall is in order for me to do beta testing, I would need the financial uh assistance to like quit my job and do it full time so just yeah those two the business plan and then what to focus on when meeting with investors uh yeah my comment on that is you know i i definitely believe that you need to have organized thinking about how you are going to attack a problem an area and how big that market is so you want something that resembles a business plan um i don't necessarily think you need to write it out word by word i tend to think in slides you know but and and i would really just address a couple of things you know one is team one is market size and then kind of uh you know the op some operational stuff about what's the product what's the cost to build and all that stuff and uh and then i'd say the yeah so i would simplify it to kind of a deck first and then try to fill out the information other things that you need for detail for that and i think after that the uh, to get it to get off the dime, uh, the the thing that moves the needle is not necessarily the idea. It's the people that are committed to helping build the idea, independent of the capital race. So I think the the more important capital these days than money capital. And I know that sounds weird because all of you are like out there trying to get money, but um, the most important capital is not the capital capital. It is the people capital to execute on an idea. And if you get great people in the into your dream to help execute and good advisors, uh, that will make all the difference in the world to getting the introductions you need for other things to refine your idea and maybe draw a little bit of capital to kind of get it off the ground. Hey, Mario. Anastasia, maybe I can just add one comment. When I look at business plan, I typically don't look at large uh, slide. I, I would try to focus on like one page written or two page at max. They can just talk about what I call concept of NABC. And NABC is just an easy acronym to remember things. And N stand for really what is the pain point? What is the need? So you should be able to articulate why you're doing it and what problem you're solving. And then A is really about what approach you're taking. Uh, and, and then B is about the benefits to your customers or benefits to your stakeholders. And then C is really about competition or alternative way of doing it. If you can articulate NIBC, I think it will make it a little easier. At least that is the core of what you want to focus on. And then there's other things about how you want to promote timeline and all that type of things. And then fundraising is a, a lot to do with the credibility uh, you can create. So think about how to view that and and to get credibility sometimes it's good to know the people in network uh, and being able to also articulate your messages in a succinct way uh, and i think it's a process and don't get uh discouraged when you get support right away this is a process where i think you 
have to just talk to a lot of people and uh, some will resonate better than others and that's how that works i can tell you zoom uh that i think the uh uh bill and i was involved lucky enough to get involved early on uh eric Yuan in 2011 could not raise money venture capitalists didn't want to support him uh because they are so that uh basically uh it was idea that's been there before and Eric was an engineering guy, never really ran company as on, and he never really raised the money before. So, you know, ever since, since then, of course, his story is made and uh, uh, we, we are happy to be part of that, uh, that the fact venture capitalists didn't support him. And that's how Bill and I got involved and support him, uh, him in the beginning as a seed round. And then that's where we are today. Uh, it's an amazing story of how you're able to find, identify the, the winners early on, right? Backing a first-time entrepreneur. That's a great, that's a legendary story. Uh, let's go to Mario for your question. Yes. Hi, everyone. It's uh, Mario from Switzerland and from Nemes Technology. We are in biotech diagnostics. And um, my question, I hope, uh, I uh, hope it's the right people to ad address it with, but I tried anyway, Young and, and Bill, um, uh, because a lot of uh, talk about um, startups, uh, the classical example is always in software. So my, my question would be, if we're going to the life science, if you build products that are very technical or, or in biology, in our case, you might have different restrictions regarding your speed of your iteration cycles and maybe some different needs also in terms of capital. So I was wondering if you're uh, thinking about your experiences with like uh, software startups maybe and then going to the life science sector or biology or very technical products. Uh, do you notice any differences in, in strategy for those startups uh, in terms of how they use the lean lean startup approach, for example, and how they how they build teams. So they would be very interested in your experience in contrast to like the typical software startup. Right. Mario, I think that you're right. Uh, there is a difference depending on what business you're in. If it's B2C business, uh, you might be able to test your product concept much earlier. Uh, what is deep tech, which I would say what you're uh, in, uh, semiconductors, for instance, is also deep tech. Those things take a lot longer time. Uh, so you got to have a lot more patience. And you got to then, uh, when it works, then of course it is a uh, very successful new way of doing things. So depend on business, it requires different type of uh, patience and different um, business, you have different business model and depend on business, you have different investors. So there's no one cookie cutter approach. And that's really important to recognize that. Uh, and as we are looking at you know, even our business, and as you're looking at extreme tech challenge, uh, I think we are also in a new journey with uh, uh, different new business that are coming. For instance, a recycled business, you know, that might be also a very long term uh, process. So uh, yeah, I think there's no one way of doing it, uh, but there are enough differences, but yet there is a business there has been in the past in your space, we can learn a lot from the practice. Great, Young. And next, let's go to you, Jessica. And we last Hi. saw you in um, Norway. Yes. Hi, nice seeing you guys again. I'm Jessica from Oslo, um, from Savvy. We are a food tech company. We uh, use AI to help cafes get accurate sales predictions and automate a lot of um, their everyday tasks. Um, I have actually, I'm gonna cheat and ask you three questions, I'm so sorry. Um, the, the first question is, what are some successful strategies that you guys have seen for scaling disruptive tech in a particularly low tech and, and quite a long tail market? Um, second question is, what are some growth metrics that are interesting for kind of industry specific B2B SaaS companies raising their seed round? Uh, and the third question is that, you know, for those of us who are raising capital, um, what ways can XTC kind of support the matchmaking process um, through your existing network? Can you describe low tech? You said uh, what uh, for low tech applications? What does that mean? No, for a low tech industry. So an industry that doesn't oh, really customers. use any tech. Yeah, 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 exactly. Nice. 
Well, Jessica, good to see you again. I, we met in Oslo event uh, last month. And uh, yeah, I know a little bit about her business. So maybe maybe um, I can add a couple of comments around that. Uh, yeah, the customer I think uh, you're targeting, if I recall, was a grocery stores and retail outlets, right? Uh, and by checking the, uh, their, their uh, business, uh, being able to help them to improve their uh, predictable uh, forecast uh, through AI. Am I right on that? Yes, that's correct. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and the um, so yeah, I think the, uh, the the there is you know even even I think uh, uh, Zoom was actually not a high high tech, but uh, because they were really going B two C, and you're going B two B. So you know B two B, a lot of B two B is about go to market. A lot of go to go to market in sense you have to convince the chains of stores to use your technology to adopt. So it uh, usually takes a longer time to do that, and then it takes patience. But at the end of the day, you have to give us SaaS metrics, metrics that are showing the what I call either lower cost of doing it, improving yield, or the uh, improving customer experience. So understanding the key metrics are really important there. And then using the metrics, being able to show venture capitalists, uh, you know, based on that uh, improvement that you have converted your um, uh, target um, customer base. And there are a number of SaaS-based uh, venture capitalists. And so take a look at that. And if you need, I'm sure Bill and I know quite a bit of venture capitalists, we can give you some introductions. So uh, you have to be ready for yourself based on business you are in, what are the key metrics, how does it go, how does it improve, and then using that uh, and then uh, talking with the right SaaS-based uh, uh, venture capitalist may be a good way to get connected. And, and I would also add that we're going to go over that uh, during the second hour is that uh, all of you are invited to participate in Crunch Match, which is a uh, you know, networking platform uh, for a global final. So we'll talk a little bit about that. That'll expose you to a community of VCs. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, next to you, Gia, for your question. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Gia. I'm dialing in from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. And we are visualized building an augmented reality platform for e-commerce. So it's like a try before you buy model. My question for you is, um, we're just coming out of beta now. And we wanted to acquire more customers. What are some of the early stage marketing strategies that we can use to for user acquisition and growth? You want to take that one, Young? Uh, I'm trying to actually, Jeff, maybe you can explain me like 90 second description of your product first. Okay, so it's a um, AR tool that we actually built in with e-commerce websites. So for example, if you have an online store and you want to sell an art piece, so what that happened, well, you can use our augmented reality tool to actually bring that into your house in 3D and mm -hmm. actually put that image, that art piece on your wall before you buy it. So that's actually a product. Yeah. Oh, well, that's great. Yeah, actually, that's a great, great idea uh, because often... Yeah, you don't know how it looks like when you're buying these things. So AR is a great way of uh, 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 probably simulating that. And the question for you is go to market challenge, right, Jia? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, have you uh, reached out some of the uh, potential target uh, studios and galleries and others and see whether they can do a partnership in helping to improve their customer experience and through that they can improve the customer conversion. Um, yeah. So the thing is like we email people, but they don't usually respond. Um, right. just being early stage. So do you think it's better to kind of um go through somebody that you know, go through your network? And I find that that's a, a maybe a challenge that a lot of startups have just mm -hmm. to get in front of customers at early stage. Uh, okay. We did use Facebook and um, Facebook ads, Google ads, which did help us. Mm -hmm. And we did land our beta customers initially, but now we're trying to grow from there. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, how do you, how do you get in front of people when they don't really check their emails uh, or don't right. answer yet? Yeah. Do you have some uh, representative customer experience that you can market 
for instance, you know, that are like in Berlin, they have like this conic uh, uh, studio, which is pretty well known there. If they're using it and then promoting it as a way of their customer experience, they could spread to other galleries. So some ways to spreading and making it wider seems to be an important part of our marketing there um, as, as well as what you're doing through Facebook and other um, advertising platform. Okay, perfect. So just like through partnerships, we do have a virtual gallery. We landed one partner. Um, mm -hmm. So we're hoping we can get some more customers through that. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I would also say um, a boot camp session is, is coming up for May 23rd to 27. I can think uh, the product market fit session could be really helpful to you and everybody who asked that question. Um, Yang, this is Taehei doing his boot camp with us again this year on product market fit. Um, oh, that'll and, be great. Yeah. Yeah. So I think he's going to have uh, some really, really good thoughts to. Yeah. Taehei is a SaaS venture capitalist mm -hmm. who, as a book called Survivor to Thriver, and uh, he will be a fantastic uh, resource for this event. He's a good friend of mine. So I think you would enjoy that. OK, great. So more resources there. Um, let's go over to Luis from Super Opa. Your question, please. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Luis. I'm talking from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, we developed a delivery app for low-income consumers that lives in the suburbs or in the favelas here in Brazil, where we originate near expired or misfitted products directly from the industry, and we manage to, to deliver in a really accessible price to these, these consumers. My doubt is in regard to the funding and investors connections that's going to happen in San Francisco. Um, we are currently uh, doing our fundraising here in Brazil, but we never had the opportunity to get in touch with international investors. And we, I was wondering if it was worth to wait a bit to close our round here is a, is a bridge round. We already raised our seed round last year and we need to need a complement to reach series a or if it's um since we are in latin america or if it's too distant from um the this connection that we're going to make with investors there it's not going to be uh feasible to bring their investment here to brazil you know, my instinct is that it, we're in a capital market environment that has been exceptionally robust the last couple of years, but it's uh, it's it's turning a bit the other way. Um, venture markets are still very full of cash, but they tend to this the emotion around them, the liquidity and pricing tends to follow what's happening with the tech stocks and NASDAQ, which um, obviously are correcting hard because of the interest rate environment, supply chain issues and a lot of stuff like that. So my instinct is that if, uh, you know, take capital when you can get it, if you do have seed capital available or bridge capital available on top of your seed now, uh, I would just make sure you structure it so it doesn't become an impediment to other capital raise. You could probably do that just by doing a safe note with some kind of a reasonable cap. Um, uh, that uh, and I think your seed investors and bridge investors now would probably be excited to have more capital come in. So I think you just kind of work with them on setting something that's logical um, to allow you to keep the door open uh, as you come out to the U.S. Okay, thank thanks a lot. Yeah, we are in a, a unpredictable environment with all this international situations. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot, Bill. Great. Hey, Paul, going to you. Hello, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> um, I'm from Hungary. Um, um, long, long way. And um, my question is uh, something about deep tech. Uh, we are developing a, a, a technology um, uh, for gearboxes in mechanical engineering. And and we are introducing something, um, a major paradigm shift in an industry which is like 1,000 years old. Uh, everybody knows tools, gears, and gearboxes in your car, in your kitchen, everywhere. And um, what, what, what we are finding that um, um, 
that people appreciate what we are doing. We may we won major competitions, pitch competitions in China, UK, Germany, US, uh, Shenzhen. Um, at the same time, we have a hard time to raise capital. And uh, the typical comment we are getting is that the technology is revolutionary. Um, lots of advantages, something a major game changer. Um, at the same time, no traction. And um, I find this as, as, a, as a major contradiction, like a yin and yang kind of contradiction, that if you are introducing some major change, a fundamental technological change, uh, that takes uh, quite a lot of money and time to develop, um, which is already a, a bottleneck. Who is going to finance all these developments? And then when you are introducing a totally new thing in the market, people are typically afraid of it. You know, there's a, a natural um, aversion against new things, um, especially if they are very different. Um, um, and, and therefore, um, this kind of comment that the, that the technology is revolutionary, but no money because there is no traction, it is a major problem because uh, if you want to introduce something totally new, a major paradigm shift, who is going to finance your, your, your company? Should they go back to academia or go back to the military or, or wherever? Um, um, we find this a, is a, is a major problem and I don't know what your comment is about this. Uh, if you really want to do some technological major uh, disruption, who is, going, who is going to finance that? Um, it might take 10 years or something. It might take a lot of money. Uh, in the meantime, you don't have the traction. You don't have customer response. You don't even exactly know what uh, the application and the need and the pain points are going to be. Uh, so um, I find this as a major problem. Is the VC world not prepared to, uh, to, to make a major innovation in the world? They are only making the quick turnaround of money or, or are there any special perhaps VCs that are prepared to finance major changes? That's yep. my question. Young Stone has a fund that does exactly that. <laughs> All right, but, we have a lot to talk about then. <laughs> well, I think I think that uh, uh, the the fundamental new technology has a lot of uh, opportunities and interest uh, on deep tech. There's uh, many deep tech focused fund in Europe as well as in the U.S. And we do that too. We do things like semiconductors and the uh, quantum compute. Uh, biology with the tech that are in combination space that was never done before. So yeah, so there is a deep tech based on investors, which tend to be more patient and waiting for long-term success. Um, the, uh, uh, I think the key for you is probably uh, having a some kind of understanding by your technology being targeted in your customer base and being able to show the benefits clearly. So then uh, once people see that uh, there, there's a customer benefit and traction, that will accelerate the adoption of the venture cap. Money follows where the action is typically, right? So if they see that this is a good technology, but can have a big impact, and there is a, a potential target customers they can understand how you know the go-to-market, clear go-to-market plan, then it may be an easier discussion. So I don't know, uh, your your technology, I'm sorry to say, but I understand just looking at Google really quick that uh, you're developing a new gear technology where um, you're trying to uh, use rolling without uh, friction to improve your energy efficiency, which I think is very interesting to me. So, um, uh, you know, try to understand the customer story and there's a cost clear customer sponsorship story. It may be easier to convince the money people to support your game plan. Awesome, thank you. I think just, just one, one reaction to that, that um, I think it is the, about risk. Um, they see the advantages, they see the benefit, but they don't believe um, if it is really going to happen because there's so many things to do still. Is it going to really work? Um, the technological questions. So the, the benefit will be there. Sometimes they think it's too good to be true. <laughs> so you have, to, you have to convince them that the benefit is there, it's going to be there if it's going to happen. And they don't, they are not sure if it's going to happen in the first place. This kind uh, of credibility. Why don't, why, don't, why don't I do this? I'll take a look at your um, uh, plan. If you can send it to me, I'll take a look. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Okay. okay. I know we have some time left, but I want to make sure we get to the four hands. Um, so thank you, Young Bill, for hanging with me for a little longer. Uh, let's go to Jim. Keep your question brief and let's get to all four uh, hands raised. Your question, please. All right. 
-hmm. Sounds good. Thanks, guys. Uh, my name is Jim. I'm CEO of Fixable, and uh, we're a Toronto-based company that uh, helps people out of pain and work toward prevention. More importantly, to build better human resilience, um, use um, AI as, as well as machine vision to get there. Um, my questions. Um, uh, number one, I think going back to your same comment, Bill, in regards to the current market and the public markets, how is that affecting you know things down the down the stream? How have you seen uh, newer companies kind of raising pre-seed seed rounds? What are the valuations looking like? We know we had some ballooning of that you know a couple of years back, but I'm definitely seeing it. You know, the the high value P ratio companies in public markets right now are getting crushed really bad. So how's that? Have you seen in the markets right right now currently uh, in that? Uh, what the numbers are looking at in regards to caps and uh, just last little comment just wanted to say a big kai border fan uh you know calls with uh jesse richman Susie mai and uh went up down to my tide the last year when you guys you know parted so it missed you unfortunately but uh yeah great crowd of guys and you know thank you for you know uh creating this guys well we're we're in barbados right now with andre philippe <laughs> doing oh, an act <laughs> trip you know with the prime minister here so if you're anywhere wow. near if you want to get on a plane it's four hours from new york but uh, uh yeah so i think the valuations they're uh things kind of they don't correlate exactly of course i think from a percentage um you know kind of rise and fall they sometimes are not far off with a little bit of lag uh, some of the public market comps, you know, great, great cash flow companies, whether it's Meta or Netflix or even Zoom, you know, they're down 50 to 80 percent from peak. And so when I look at the uh, hot money early stage seed, pure seed valuations on a couple people and an idea, you know, probably the 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 high, 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 uh, you know, part of that ecosystem sometimes gets expressed in things like Y Combinator. And uh, I'd seen, you know, kind of pre, cause they're sort of, sort of pre-selected. Those, those got as high, it seems as kind of, you know, 20, 20 million pre-money, $20 million pre-money valuation, sometimes higher uh, on teams with not much more than an idea and, you know, a little bit of traction. Actually, most of them have some kind of product out there. And I'd say, things things are some of the like regular companies they're probably coming back down to like three to five pre on raises of you know on seven high six figure seven figure raises for good quality projects you know which isn't too far off from a you know 50 to 80 percent drop from not super high growth companies and uh, so I, I don't know, you know, every every situation is different as are the public companies, but I'd say for a team that is sought after, that has experience that, uh, you know, logic, you can logic your way into a good execution into a very large market. I wouldn't be surprised if those still can command valuations in the high single digit pre-money on seven figure raises, um, but kind of a range of five to eight. Yeah. Uh, is not out of the question. Got it. Thank you for that. Okay, let's go to Dan. Dan, Hi everybody. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I'm Dan Cohen. I'm the founder of Flight Material Sciences in Montreal and Boston. Thanks for uh, for being here and for the AMA. I'll try to make it quick. Because we have a material science innovation, uh, we apply to a wide variety of materials, which means we can provide benefits in a lot of different industries. <clears throat> and some investors and advisors are saying, you need to focus on one or two beachhead industries, get somewhere in those, and then you can pursue others along uh, in time. And others want to know that we can do validation in a wide variety of industries to prevent the risk of the company, uh, depending on our success in one specific area, especially if it's regulated. So I wanted to hear your thoughts about whether we go broad or whether we go deep as a strategy. Well, I think that uh, typically it's good to show uh, you can be successful in certain area with a long-term potential that you can apply to multiple markets. So I think most of them is right. Question of when you want to show them. But first, you got to show some efficacy and specific area that it works so that it gives them confidence. And then with that confidence, you can build it a bigger picture, maybe. Okay, fair. Thank you. Okay. Great. Let's go to uh, court. Uh, 
Uh, there we go. Hi, hi guys. Sorry, it, uh, just uh, landed back from uh, California and uh, WA. I think I've had about four hours of jet lag sleep, so it took me longer to find that unmute button. <laughs> um, I've got a question on on focus, uh, but but on the other end. So Max Mine is a mining uh, decarbonization productivity play, and I don't mean crypto mining. Um, I mean traditional mining of extraction. Um, there's no net zero without significantly improved mining. Um, and we, we need to get a lot better at this game. It's it's a, it's it's a terribly unproductive. So th the question I've got is around focus. And you know, if I if I'm going to worry about the thing I worry about most, we're in a scale up play, um, and it's it's dollars, but it's really engineering hours. There's only so many quality engineering hours we have access to right now. We've had to put a few projects on on the shelf just because um, we don't want to time slice. Um, and we've got this problem that customers are asking us to build new and better features, and, and they're very excited, which is a great problem to have. And so my question is around, if engineering hours are very scarce, what are some of the frameworks for trading off between near-term wins and therefore more ARR and also building some capacity and platform for future growth? And, and I mean near-term future growth, I don't mean like years out. Just a few thoughts, especially with the current labor market. Bill, you want to give a try? Uh, you know, young you, you mining business. Yeah, well, yeah, you a well, different kind of mining. It's actually uh, decarbonization of the actual, like, uh, you know, kind of iron ore and other mines. Um, uh, yeah, Court, I think it actually young has more, or young through Samsung probably has more experience, uh, uh, you know, launching kind of hardware systems products into big enterprise. Uh, but um, yeah, I think. I think, you know, you're proving out, it's always about find a model that, that is lowering friction to use. I mean, so, so what I do with software stuff mostly now, even though I started- hardware, Our friction is in software right now, just for clarity, like it's okay. the software engineering hours, like the hardware yeah. we're, we're working and solving, but it's, um, we want to build four products, we're only building two now. Got it. Well, so, you know, you, the, I, I, I try never to be, formulaic because you know i don't like uh structure for one <laughs> you know what i and every situation is different i like to be very fluid but if there is a formula that has worked for companies i've been involved with across hardware and software and medical and genomics and everything else it's three things it's lower the friction to a use case but in a big market Two is make the application of that, you know, uh, that lower friction uh, replicable and then have in place the infrastructure to scale, right? So lower friction, replicate scale, lower friction, replicate scale. That's what Zoom did. That's what Canva did. That's what a piece of silicon does. It basically takes something that's hard to do and makes it a little easier to do. So to the extent that you can define a pod, that you already have uh, and, and make it really easy for the customer to install, uh, very kind of you know, unitized so that you can just repackage that and get that out there and then put in place the infrastructure if, it, if you have big demand for it to, to uh, replicate the replication. That's kind of, that's all, that's all I ever do. I look, I talk to entrepreneurs, I look at the market, is it a problem that I think needs to be solved that can be solved at scale with the addition of a little bit of technology to lower friction, replicate at scale? And if it can be, I write a check. You know, if I if I think it can, if I if it's something that I really kind of emotionally bond with. So uh, I think that probably applies to what you're doing with the big mining companies. If you can think of the commonality across that vertical with other companies, friction is a huge issue. Um, so no, I think that yeah. is a, a good additional point to put in. Thank you. And if you do to go to South Africa, False Bay, which is the other side of Table Mountain, the water is a lot warmer. Good, good, good. Look forward to that. Thanks. Yeah. So I, I would just try to put it in those terms. You know, how do I take uh, what solutions? Because I know you're trying to choose between different kinds of software solutions. You also have, and hardware solutions. You have to look at um, what are, you know, map out what your customers are in your vertical and some of the other ones to try to think, well, what, I, you know, I can solve the problem with this, but is it going to be easy for the other verticals to ingest that or not because different companies use different things 
And uh, you don't want to have to introduce a whole other procurement process around whole other stuff. Like if, you're, if they're already qualified on certain kinds of things, even though the software may be a little older and clunkier, you reduce risk and reduce your cost of customer acquisition with stuff that uh, is already familiar to them. Mm. Thank you. All right. And I see uh, Burke, you've been waiting patiently. <laughs> Thank you so much. And you said my name perfectly. Uh, my name is uh, Burke. I'm co-founder at uh, Udify, which is a mental health platform that acts as a hub connecting students to personalized and evidence-based mental health resources, uh, making it as simple as possible to cut the fray and the noise out. Um, first off, I just want to say thanks to XTC for providing such incredible value for us as finalists. Just, it's amazing that we're getting this value already. We just appreciate it. Our, our entire team is looking right now, and we appreciate this so much. Uh, but secondarily, my research and background is in behavior change, understanding intrinsic and extrinsic motivations, and in the kind of token, tokenized uh based economics, really we're focusing on how do we empower students to be able to improve their mental health uh, by rewarding them and also making the path tied to their personality. I'd love to hear uh, what, what thoughts the both of you have when it comes to kind of the web free environment. Young, you want me to or you? Yeah, I can start. Sure. Okay, maybe uh, uh, in terms of your experience, which I think is very important, right, to, uh, yeah. uh, for your audience, what experience do you expect that they will go through? Uh, the students? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so I think one of the main things that happens is when students come to a university, it's almost the second time in their life that they experience this kind of loss of tribe trying to figure out who they are. Uh, there is an often, they have the, I think 75% of students have experienced some form of anxiety or depression. Uh, the level of uh, students that are not getting the access they need to clinical or subclinical uh, interventions is, is so low. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to say, hey, these resources are available to you. And if you engage in your own improvement of mental health, we want to kind of tokenize that process and at the same time be able to cut the noise out. So it seems that most difficulty that, that, that the students are experiencing are, is the difficulty of getting to the intervention, right? There's obviously a stigma when it comes to getting mental health uh, uh, services. But at the same time, there's this kind of paralysis by choice. There's so much information that's available. And a lot of the students have said it's difficult to know what's best for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It sounds like it really absolutely true. I think there, are, there was a uh, podcast from one of Yale uh, professor talking about how big and how prevalent this problem is. Even school like Yale, which is a great school to, uh, and difficult school to get into, but yet the anxiety level is so high and hard to acknowledge those issues. So yeah, it looks like you're really working on a big problem. So my big NABC perspective, that's uh, where, I, you know, it's, it's a big pain point. And right. then question I think is the, uh, like the Bill described, how are you making that frictionless, which I think is where the tokenization may be coming in to make it easier to get the process going. Yeah, it's, it's exactly it. It's, it's kind of finding the internal motivation, which is if I work on my mental health, we provide, you know, psychoeducation, uh, coaching, therapy, and this, and we're agnostic. It doesn't matter where it's coming from as long as it's evidence-based. By doing that, you gain your own intrinsic motivation. Uh, but at the same time, sometimes people fall off, right? And that's something that the attrition rate is so high. And so finding a way to uh, create and excavate tokens so that people are more engaged is something that we're really trying yeah. to push and the idea seems to be working. Go ahead. I would, I would throw out a couple ideas to think about. I think you yeah. know, Web3 brings about really interesting, uh, uh, a really interesting change in the economic flow of the attention economy. And hmm. that's a lot, that's a lot of like buzzwords there, but I think there's two elements that I think might be applicable to what you wanna do, which is one, creating the, the uh, incentive to go on that journey to get the help in different forms. And I think the other is reducing the friction to uh, feeling like something's wrong with you, right. you know, if you do this. So I would look at uh, some things like uh, the zero knowledge proof, uh, kind of zero, zero knowledge, to look at zero knowledge, uh, generally speaking, in tokenization that allows somebody to come on, enter an ecosystem, uh, sort of contribute with some level of anonymity uh, their data without people knowing specifically who they are 
to then potentially allow comparison to like, you know, how do I feel compared to everybody else? Where do I stand compared to everybody else? Right. You know, which is, I think the relevancy part of that could be important to getting people interested. And I'd say the other thing to look at is um, um, what's loosely called gamification. You know, the reward system that could come with the tokenomics of, of if you have a structured program that takes you from, you know, point A to point Z in wellness, um, some measure of every time somebody comes on to hit that next stage, they're getting some tokens. They're almost like loyalty points, right? But they're, right. they're effectively a blockchain-based token that allows the user to uh, interact, uh, measure themselves against whatever they think is interesting. Uh, those rewards could be provided by health providers that make money off of providing services that are willing to sponsor uh, so to speak, the, you know, instead of an ad, yeah. it's the placement of a redeemable token in the hands of the person trying to come to that ecosystem. I, I, I have a feeling that, you know, that, that something like that might work. I absolutely love that. I think one of the things that we're doing right now is making it redeemable for swag that you get at this school. And then at the same time for events that are happening uh, outside. But I love this idea of uh, comparing yourself to, to another, because what people need to feel is some sense of self-efficacy that, that, I did better than I was yesterday. And yeah. we're really trying to make it yeah. an adventure. We have all animation relative. and everything. All relative measurement against yourself, your goals, yeah. people. Yeah. It, and and I see it already. Like, you know, I, I drive this thing, which is a NFT for good thing called MetaGood, mm-hmm. which has an on-chain monkey collection. People will spend hours and hours to earn uh, tokens, in our case, bananas, on Twitter and Discord, uh, and turn those in for hats and T-shirts. And things, and it's the beginning of a basically a micro economy where right. someday we may be able to swap in uh, goods and services backing the currency. You know, so instead of gold or or barrels of oil, it's basically you know good karma uh, yeah. and an intention that can be spent. Absolutely, wow, yeah, this is exactly what we're trying to get is the network effect. It's more so if we can normalize the the movement and into of individuals that's happening that micro economy then all of a sudden it becomes a, a, a topic piece. We even have it where we want to have an augmented reality kind of token that you get once you hit a certain amount. And so it's this, hey, a talking piece to reduce the stigma, to make it just a little bit easier to, to engage in this conversation. Yeah, no, it, it, it's happening, definitely. Happening. Yeah, the other company, the approach you may want to look at is, uh, we invest in a company called Noom, uh, which I think is really about in the beginning, it's all about, all about uh, taking a good habit of a uh, diet and then actually uh, com- converting the diet along with your uh, uh, change to improve your, your health. And the combination turned out to be a fairly good uh, way to do it. And they have, uh, uh, they changed the real business plan over time to have the coaches in a way that, that become a, a business model. They worked out really well. So Anyway, just another way of changing behavior, right? That's what you're looking at here. Thank you so much, both of you. Really appreciate well, it. I, I've got one question hanging out there. I know we're over time for this uh, portion, but I, I don't want to leave one hanging. So Zane, ask your question, please. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Zane Farooq, and I'm uh, here from Pakistan. So uh, I'm the founder of MyTM. So uh, recently, you know, we were able to uh, secure a position uh, in the Jitex that was held in Dubai. And uh, why I wanted to, the question I wanted to ask was that we are working on something that is re- related to financial inclusion. Now I'm talking about the fifth largest population in the world and the third largest youngest population in the world. You know, uh, we talk about data protection, but when I pitch, I tell about people, 90 million people who are not even part of the data. Now this has led to rejections but that this has also created traction for me. So do you think uh, as a founder, we should uh, disclose all the possible negativities that exist in the certain market that we're operating in? Because those negativities are actually facts and then these facts are actually problems that we're trying to solve. And my question here is exactly the same that I just asked, that should we cover or should we, you know, go around these problems? Because ultimately, when we're talking about digital inclusion, uh, digital financial inclusion, 
what should we aim for? Should we aim for the processes or should we, should we aim for the problem that we are solving? Is my question clear? I think so, uh, Zain. I think that uh, data is a uh, whole new space. Uh, uh, I, I think that the change in data rules and regulation is changing uh, re uh, very rapidly, as you know, uh, and also it changes from country to country. So I do not know the rules in your country. So it's hard for me to comment on it. There's a clearly a clear rules that are happening in the EU. Uh, US is also changing. And, and then the degree of change uh, much different from Korea, Japan, all the way to where you are. So how to comment on this particular subject, mainly because regulation rules are very different. I think the key is that you have to be, whatever the service you're providing, you are in a country with the regulation that you have to think through the regulation versus the business model and making sure they're compatible. And the surprising thing is like, you know, the comparative case study that we go with, uh, for example, in the subcontinent, especially if we, if we go with India, Nepal, or Bangladesh, we see these regulations coming in, like, you know, if, if something happened in India in 2013, it's happening in Pakistan in 2019. So, of course, like, you know, it's like, it's kind of a predictable movement uh, for startup like ours. Uh, and then, you know, the, the names sometimes get similarities, like ATM in India and then MyTM in Pakistan. We were recently, recently able to disclose, uh, like, close a funding round of $6.9 million as well. And what we are now doing is actually concentrating more on the uh, reach of financial services uh, rather than the technology stack itself. But, but then at the other end, uh, some kind of problems, for example, like you cannot operate uh, the data on a, on, on a cloud server, you have to keep it on a local server. These kind of things do uh, you know, affect scalability. So this is what what we uh, what basically is a risk for, for for markets like us. But do you think that disclosing this, these risks or hiding them or like clarifying them and then going for the risk mitigation do entrust investors and and also uh, you know advisors to like you know work uh, in coordination with the founders in the long run? I think they do. And uh, actually, I just put a thing in the thread that everybody will find interesting, which was, you know, how Jack Dorsey pitched Square, which is the 140 reasons it would fail or something like that. But, but um, uh, for you many, many years, I've, I've, when I'm working with like super early stage teams, like three, five, seven people, uh, I always will end up going through an exercise with the teams where I'll go to a whiteboard with them and I'll ask them um, to put on a, a, a kind of a list, the 10 things that if they happen, the company is out of business. And then, uh, then we'll go through an exercise to, to rank those in probability of them happening. And then the, you know, the key message at the end of that is we have a pretty good like a, kind of a risk assessment of where to apply capital to reduce risks that could kill us. And in the end, if you've knocked down all of those, by definition, you're alive. But Bill, and here, here one, one, one thing I want to add. You see, for investors, transactions matter. Even if we build a technology and we're not able to make a transaction, means we are a failed uh, startup. So there the you go. That's risk important. number then one. Then, so, so you, yeah. So you know what that risk is, and you got to lay it out there because the investors that have, think they have insight into that risk going away are going to be interested, and the ones that aren't, they're not. And then if you fool one of them to come in, and they get they feel like they were fooled, whether or not you fooled them or they fooled themselves, they're going to think that you're a you know a liar. <laughs> so. <laughs> so I think it's really important to align interests in the beginning and, and make sure people know what they're getting into. That makes the capital a lot stickier. Yeah, I think so in the, uh, at the end of the day, I think companies and partners have the same mission, which is building great companies together and they are partners. And I think partners have to have that transparency. The more they understand the risk and where the data or the state of the company is, the better likely you're going to be building a better company together.
Thank you so much, you. Paul. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. I would just want to wish everyone a happy Eid. It's actually a festival here. So, Jiru Kualas, to all the Chinese friends, and a happy, happy Eid to all, everybody who's present there. Great. Thank you so much. So, this wraps up our AMA with Yell and Bill.